Um, my name is Dr. Alexis Ripo, and I'm an assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and the program director for the Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship. Um, so I'm here tonight to uh, talk about how to work with your prescriber um, around issues surrounding um, prescribed benzodiazepines. Um, as far as my background, um, as an addiction psychiatrist, became interested in prescribed benzodiazepines because um, of the issues surrounding physical dependence and, and withdrawal uh, that happens when um, they're stopped too abruptly or um, withdrawn too quickly, um, and realized that uh, these were being prescribed a lot by um, my physician colleagues, and we don't have good education or information around it. So um, these slides were made uh, by the Alliance and, and by my colleague, um, Dr. Stephen Wright. And so I kept the acknowledgement he gives, which is to all the benzodiazepine survivors who kept courage when we, the prescribers, weren't listening. Um, and this, the, the scream, I think, can represent um, maybe only a fraction of how many patients feel amidst the turmoil of um, experiencing uh, a bunch of unexplained um, and debilitating symptoms from benzodiazepines. Um, so some of this will probably not be new information to any of you, but just as a quick review, you know, in, in the United States, uh, there are, I think it's 14 benzodiazepines that are prescribed. There's actually some others and some other related benzodiazepines, you know, prescribed in other countries. Um, but these are the ones uh, we have here, some more familiar than others, of course, Alprazolam or Xanax, Diazepam, which is Valium, uh, clonazepam, which is clonopin, lorazepam, or Ativan, um, and being you know, some of the most frequently um, prescribed medications, um, actually of all medications. Um, we also include the Z drugs, so uh, Zolpidem, which is Ambien, and, and some of the others, um, because they are uh, all together working on the same benzodiazepine receptor. So um, we call them benzodiazepine receptor agonists. Um, and, you know, as, as many of you here probably know, a large, the vast majority of issues that people have with benzodiazepine comes from taking them as prescribed and developing this physiologic dependence, um, which is not addiction. Um, uh, physical dependence can be part of developing an addiction, but an addiction also requires that one has can, uh, loss of control of their use or compulsive use and consequences from their use, um, like continuing to use despite causing uh, physical harm, making psychological uh, issues worse, affecting relationships, work, job. Um, like I said, vast majority of people have been taking these benzodiazepines as prescribed um, and just by the nature of these medications develop physiologic um, dependence. Um, some other terms that come up, um, you'll hear us, we refer to them as GABA receptor agonists. So GABA, gamma amino butyric acid um, is the, um, the receptor, um, is the, ma the major receptor where benzodiazepines work. It's also the major receptor where alcohol works, they work in slightly different ways, um, and GABA, is um, the chemical itself is actually the major inhibitory um, chemical. So um, um, when benzos work on the GABA receptor, they're actually increasing the inhibition on the nervous tone. So that's why they're considered a central nervous system depressant. Um, uh, BZD, when you see that, we're talking about benzodiazepines. Uh, BZRA means the benzodiazepines plus the Z drugs. So these other receptor, benzoreceptor agonists. Um, we always said the Z drugs are, are these sleep medications that are not benzodiazepines, but are working at the same receptor. Um, and uh, BZWS um, is our shorthand for the benzodiazepine uh, receptor agonist withdrawal syndrome and bin, bind uh, being the benzo receptor agonist induced neurologic dysfunction. Um, so, you know, overall, when patients present and think or feel like they likely know that they are having difficulty and then it may be related to the benzodiazepine that they are taking, um, it's 
it's hard for many prescribers to wrap their head around that. Um, and that is because um, these medications have been in use for over 60 years. And when they came around, uh, you know, we were told, oh, these are far safer than the other um, sedative hypnotics we've been using, like the barbiturates. Um, people don't get addicted to them and don't develop physical dependence to them, um, and they're not dangerous. Um, and that was kind of passed along um, person by person. Um, and the actual education that any prescribers receive about uh, benzodiazepines um, is very limited um, in, in both medical school and residency. Um, and I added here actually that, you know, I think if you asked many prescribers, including, you know, primary care where the majority of these are being prescribed, and even maybe in psychi psychiatry where many are um, prescribed, um, are maybe unaware that in September 2020, the FDA required a box warning be added to uh, their prescribing information as well as their medication guides um, to provide further education about how to safely use uh, this class of, of drugs. Um, you know, some of the risks that we wish prescribers were more aware of um, include uh, sedation that they can cause dizziness, uh, vertigo, fatigue, um, other cognitive issues, including decreased memory and attention, uh, psychomotor impairment, uh, so um, slurred speech, falls, motor vehicle accidents, injuries. Um, and then there are even some people um, that can actually have what we call almost paradoxical effects from these, so getting the opposite effect of what we didn't intend. So instead of um, being uh, more relaxed or helping them sleep, they might get irritable, excited, aggressive, hostile, uh, violent. Um, the other risks, um, they can have um, adverse effects on mood, um, including suicidality, worsening depression, and just blunting overall emotions um, can also have some complex um, interactions in the setting of a bipolar disorder um, and a manic episode. Um, you know, the tolerance and physical dependence are really the things, you know, that we drive home, especially through the Alliance, but that as people take these regularly, um, more than the two to four weeks that they're really, um, we have evidence for, you build tolerance, meaning you need more to get the same effect, um, and you become physically dependent such that um, if you were to cut back too quickly or stop, um, you will experience withdrawal symptoms. Um, additionally, people uh, can get an intoxication effect from them, especially if combined with uh, other central nervous system depressants like alcohol or opioids, um, and then some people do uh, develop a substance use disorder or addiction to them. Um, kind of already mentioned, again, the withdrawal problems. I'll talk a little more about those, but of course, uh, kind of two parts to this, prescribers not being aware about and not educating their patients about the risk of acute withdrawal, um, should they cut back or quit uh, or stop um, suddenly, but also not having and a lot, of, a lot of this being a lack of good research, but not as not having a good sense of um, patients suffering from protracted withdrawal that can go on weeks, months, and even um, in some cases, uh, years. Um, additionally, that as central nervous system depressants, these really cause a respiratory depression um, and are frequently involved in overdose deaths, especially when combined with opioids. Uh, there's uh, 30% of overdose deaths with opioids include a benzodiazepine, and we know that it's in the first 90 days of overlap between a use of an opioid and a benzodiazepine that the risk of an unintentional overdose goes up fivefold. Um, and I think that is not something that we do a good job of telling our patients if we see that they're intermittently getting opioid scripts for acute pain um, and on a benzodiazepine or vice versa on a chronic opioid and intermittently getting um, a benzo. Um, and really all of those patients, uh, if they are given those, should be prescribed uh, naloxone um, in case they were to experience an unintentional overdose. Um, and overall, we just know that folks that are on uh, benzodiazepines chronically, um, that there's an increased risk of mortality. 
Um, so the, the puzzle gets even harder as we get into uh, what's going on with the, the acute and the prolonged withdrawal um, because it's not widely recognized. We have not um, had a lot of research funded to look at what these withdrawal symptoms look like. We've kind of said, oh, it works on the GABA receptor, alcohol works on the GABA receptor. So I think we can kind of evaluate it and treat it like we do alcohol withdrawal. And that's just way over oversimplifying it. Um, so I think this really is the, you know, the next prescription medication epidemic for different reasons than opioids, um, where we really need to put a lot more time, energy, and funding into trying to understand uh, the acute and, and the prolonged withdrawal um, syndromes. Um, and part of why it's so hard, as, as those here may know, is that these symptoms, um, we don't have them well defined. We don't have a great understanding of why they're so variable, why some, some individuals are so much more sensitive um, to these um, acute and prolonged withdrawal symptoms. Some of them seem somewhat unrelated to the mechanism of the medication itself. Um, on the GABA receptor, um, and the symptoms overall can really start to look like symptoms from other um, diagnoses. So not, you know, not infrequently, um, people are just continued on the benzodiazepines because it can be harder to stop them than um, just continue them, um, or they've had such a bad experience at some point being rapidly tapered or abruptly discontinued or, you know, uh, running out of prescription um, that they never want to go through it again. Um, and, you know, we also have the issue of that prescribers, there's a lot of constraints on time and reimbursement um, to make sure that prescribers uh, adequately address this issue. Um, so I'm not going to go into the, the whole uh, pathophysiology here, but, you know, part of the point here is the neurophysiology of these medications, they have I think prescribers are often taught, oh, they work on the GABA system, but the truth is centrally, they're working on multiple systems, um, as you can see by the, the four listed there. And then they're also acting peripherally. So you have benzodiazepine receptors in your peripheral um, nervous system. And um, these are probably actually also having a pretty significant interplay in some of this, especially the protracted withdrawal symptoms. We just haven't... Um, haven't followed up on. You'll see a lot of the research was in the in the '90s for some of that stuff, and it just hasn't been followed up on. Um, and so um, uh, this comes. So S Steve Wright, um, who was the medical director of the Alliance, um, and has has this encyclopedic knowledge of all things related to benzodiazepines. Um, has thought that it's quite likely that these peripheral benzodiazepine receptors uh, could be involved in these the benzodiazepine withdrawal and could explain adverse reactions and withdrawal reactions and might be a target for future therapies. Um, and Alliance has uh, funded some research at University of Arizona to look at some of these questions. Um, you know, and I think it's just another example of trying to validate that the um, suffering that benzodiazepine survivors have experienced um, is not just in their heads, um, um, but really something that is happening. Um, and so again, um, Steve has counted and found references for up to 140 different withdrawal symptoms that have been reported in the literature, even if infrequently. Um, and you can kind of think of them as broken into, you know, there's some that are psychological symptoms. So we talked about um, some of them that happen when you're using the benzodiazepines with withdrawal, some people will get um, depersonalization, derealization, which is kind of you lose uh, a sense of yourself or a sense of time and reality um, and kind of feel dis disconnected. Um, uh, certainly people will get rebound anxiety and insomnia. There's more neurophysiologic symptoms, um, so kind of more uh, things like electric shock sensations, um, uh, similar to how with opioids, we've seen that if people are using them frequently, they get this sensitization and both become more sensitive to pain in addition to their tolerance to opioids. Um, and there's probably a central um, uh, sensitization that folks experience with, uh, with um, 
benzodiazepines that cause them to both be more sensitive to anxiety um, as well as tolerant to the medications they might have been initially prescribed to treat that anxiety. Um, and can experience other perceptual disturbances, so hallucinations like um, touch, smells, tastes, seeing things, hearing things that they're not, you know, not sure are actually there and others may aren't experiencing. Um, and somatic symptoms, so nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, um, chest pain. So if you want to see the whole library um, on the Alliance website, uh, there's a whole, whole list. And again, some of these, you know, we kind of expect um, or depending on the prescriber in their area of training, they may expect more than others. Um, and others get misdiagnosed um, as other presentations or um, disorders. Um, what we do know and, and was first um, began to be characterized by Heather Ashton in Great Britain was that, you know, the longer someone has gone, uh, off of a benzodiazepine that overall you will see a decline in the severity of their withdrawal symptoms. However, what can further be confusing is that we tend to see um, them overall there's a decline, but it kind of comes in these, uh, what they referred to as waves and windows. Um, and so it can be confusing that you think someone's gotten through what you, the acute withdrawal and now is having weeks, months down the road, some recurrence of symptoms, and often we don't tie it back to uh, the, the benzodiazepine withdrawal because um, we don't think of it as being related. Um, so this was just from one of these studies, uh, actually in 1982, um, looking at um, the intensity score of uh, withdrawal symptoms um, in 10 different patients that were physically dependent to diazepam valium um, and you can see that it's kind of all over the map right they all there's what pattern individuals experienced in their symptoms over a course of six weeks um, and you know what we don't have the research to say is even why there's this variability or what makes someone more susceptible to a, a more difficult um, withdrawal course um, both the withdrawal syndrome and probably the the more prolonged withdrawal or or which which has also been referred to as a benzodiazepine induced neurologic dysfunction to try to kind of capture just the wide array of symptoms some individuals can experience with the protracted withdrawal. Um, these can commonly get misdiagnosed. So either misdiagnosed as continued worsened anxiety or insomnia um, as someone just having this physiologic need to be on a benzodiazepine or um, a sleep medication, um, fibromyalgia, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, some, so some of these kind of complex um, disorders that have a lot of symptoms um, and where we similarly don't have a lot of good um, understanding yet about what makes certain individuals more susceptible or, or the um, a clear pathophysiology. We have some, some research pointing to certain risk factors and maybe some potential mechanisms, but nothing clear. Um, other things include early onset multiple sclerosis, Lyme disease, and then somatic symptom disorder, um, which is a psychiatric disorder. Um, and probably one of the more common things individuals experiencing uh, benzodiazepine withdrawal um, may feel like they're kind of getting labeled with um, that they're, that someone's focusing so much on their physical symptoms um, and that it is causing a lot of distress and difficulty in their functioning and that the um, thoughts, feelings, behaviors that relate to these physical symptoms is now uh, believed to be in excess of whatever is actually causing the symptoms. So, um, and it can be very invalidating for people to feel like that is what um, either they are formally being diagnosed as or what um, they're kind of assessed as experiencing. So I added this slide because um, the more I hear about um, um, individuals suffering from you know, such a huge variety of symptoms with protracted withdrawal, the more it makes me think about what we're hearing about this post-acute COVID syndrome or long COVID. Um, and, you know, it took a little bit 
for this to take steam, but because of how many people COVID has affected in such a short amount of time um, and, and such a vocal group, you know, it went from being kind of in the, in the, probably on some Facebook groups to the news to now making it into, you know, a year later, a nature medicine article where they said patient ad advocacy group, many members of which identify themselves as long haulers have helped contribute to the recognition of post-acute COVID-19, a syndrome characterized by persistent symptoms and or delayed or long-term complications beyond four weeks from the onset of symptoms. Um, you know, and then they go on to describe just this whole myriad um, of symptoms that don't necessarily feel like they're particularly related to the, you know, initial um, viral illness, but now they're really pouring uh, money, time, um, and research into trying to understand the pathophysiology. So hopefully we can get there with uh, benzodiazepine withdrawal as well. So, um, you know, the focus of this talk is finding a prescriber who, who will work with you in addressing um, the difficulties that benzodiazepine, prescribed benzodiazepines um, may be causing. Um, and so, you know, first and foremost is, is finding a prescriber who will listen, um, who acknowledges what you're experiencing, validates it um, as, as something that you are really struggling with and suffering from, is open and willing to learn more um, if they don't know, if they do not feel like they are well informed about what is currently known about benzodiazepines and benzodiazepine withdrawal. Um, and, you know, if, 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 if uh, patients are so lucky, then finding a, a prescriber that already has some of the skills and knowledge um, and kind of the best case scenario is finding a prescriber that is already kind of um, has enough skills and knowledge that they would be labeled um, benzo wise. Um, but I think, you know, first and foremost, just finding these first several steps um, goes a long way if you have a prescriber that's willing to listen and learn. Um, and it will benefit them and it will benefit uh, not only you, but the, all of their patients. Um, and, you know, we want to reiterate that we know uh, those that have been harmed by benzos may feel like uh, they can't trust other people, that they've been made to feel like they were um, suffering from an addiction to the benzodiazepines, even if that wasn't the case, um, that they were a criminal or should be pu uh, punished. Um, that they've been made to feel stupid or talked down to by prescribers, um, and that they've been made to feel at times like their prescribers uh, aren't concerned or don't um, pay attention to the symptoms they're endorsing um, and aren't listening to them. So, um, you know, we will remind you that while most prescribers have not been adequately trained about the current problem or an extent of the problem with benzodiazepines, um, and how to taper them, um, uh, that we will, you know, encourage you and give you some, some tools to provide a prescriber to assist you. Um, there is no, you know, official certification for becoming a benzo-wise prescriber. Um, the, our colleagues at the Benzo Diazepine Information Coalition, which we refer to as BIC, um, create, uh, keep a list of prescribers um, as they come across them, and that's their website there. Um, and, you know, but I would say you can um, make many prescribers, hopefully, uh, more benzo-wise um, if they feel willing to listen to you um, and to learn more. Um, and so um, encourage you to, if you haven't already, really explore the Alliance uh, website um, learn more about the terminology and the benzodiazepine um, uh, basics, look at the information they provide about how to speak with your medical um, uh, provider, and um, they have a test for talking to your medical um, provider and getting a sense of what information you would need to provide them to get them more benzo-informed. Um, and, and see what you need your prescriber's help for. So do you need guidance with tapering? Um, do you need um, help with trying to determine which symptoms are, may indeed be due to benzodiazepines or benzodiazepine withdrawal? 
um, adjust, addressing symptoms related to that um, or just being continued on the benzodiazepine. Um, and uh, one of the pamphlets really focuses on, you know, how do you take a positive appeal to engage your prescriber and, and let them know I need your help and I need you on my team. Um, and so I would encourage you to look through um, that and then ask them um, if you can share some of the other evidence-based information about benzodiazepines that you've learned of through uh, the Alliance um, and um, make sure that they have the best source of information. So most people's view of how you get someone off benzodiazepines is how you get them off of alcohol if they have an alcohol use disorder is that you send them somewhere and they abruptly discontinue them. And um, for the vast majority of patients, that is not the current recommendation. If someone has just physical dependence to benzodiazepines, it's kind of a patient by patient um, approach. Um, and uh, we need to figure out you know, what we're best for each patient. Hopefully as we get more research, we have a better way of predicting what's gonna work best. There are some people that can stop more abruptly, others that can do it in kind of a pretty brief period. And then some find that in order to tolerate it, they really need to make it slow and do these micro uh, dosing tapers. So, um, you know, working with your uh, prescriber to figure out what is going to work best for you. Um, and there are these, you know, all to, uh, a whole slew of um, tools that have been made on the Alliance, um, developed for, um, by and for clinicians and pharmacists that are evidence-based. We encourage you to print them out or ask if you can, you know, send them along to your prescriber. Um, so with that, um, I will open it up to, to questions 